one of the most important aspects, but not the only, is how receptive are we to feedback and how does our type influence that? Mm -hmm. And interestingly, some of the underground types are pretty closed off to feedback. It doesn't matter because they, and certain ones are overly responsive to feedback. Oh, you think this? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That must be true. Because I always say, uh -huh. you have to think about, is it, is it true and is it useful? Because it could be true but mm -hmm. not useful, <laughs> right? Or right. it could be useful but not particularly true. Welcome to the Culture Gooder Podcast with Stephen Leese and Sean Tinney. This podcast is a behind-the-shades look at creating and changing culture inside of Gooder Sunglasses. You can live with the status quo, you can challenge the status quo, or you can do what we do at Gooder and status the quote challenge. All right. Well, welcome to the Culture Gooder podcast, everyone. Today, we're joined by Ginger Lapid Bogda, an internationally recognized Enneagram author, trainer, keynote speaker. I've personally read a number of her books, um, and I'm just really excited to help bring some of uh, Ginger's wisdom to the podcast today because we do use the Enneagram a lot here at Gooder, um, and that's why we've asked her to come on and just share some of her insights. So welcome, Ginger. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here, and I love your sunglasses. Oh, thank you. Glad to hear it. <laughs> um, well, so, you know, uh, right. Awesome. But first things first, you know, I feel like the Enneagram has been gaining popularity lately, especially on social media. It's kind of getting out there. But in case someone's not familiar with it, can you just provide a high level brief overview of the Enneagram as you uh, understand it? Well, I'm going to do a brief high level overview of a system that's probably over 4,000 years old and has <laughs> multiple dimensions of dynamics and complexity okay so um but and i will because i find it uh, fun to do that so the enneagram system is sometimes people refer to it as a, a personality system but i don't mm. i consider it a system it? it's a map of nine different architectures or archetypes of human beings and it's the whole system and the diagram everything about it been evolving over decades and centuries, etc. So it's a very ancient system, but with enormous uh, new applications. And it's very popular. It is both in the psychological communities and the spiritual communities, and a really popular in using in the business or organizational sector. So mm -hmm. the Enya means nine and Graham means points. And it refers to nine different architectures or archetypes, numbered one through nine. And each of them have a specific worldview, patterns of thinking that are unique to them, to, to emotional patterns and behavioral patterns. So, mm -hmm. and then the thing is, and the journey is to figure out which of those nine types most kind of reflects how you think, feel, and what you do and your worldview. So with that in mind, then this is the tour of the nine types. So Enneagram type ones um, like to make the world as perfect as possible, make themselves as perfect as possible and help us become more perfect, even though they know perfectionism is actually um, an aspiration. It's not necessarily the end. So they mm -hmm. tend to be have discerning minds. They like to get things right. They avoid mistakes. Enneagram twos think that the world should be alleviated of suffering and pain and difficulties and they want to help the rest of us i'm a two so i'm talking about us but help everyone <laughs> sort of not suffer and to find their way and to feel better and good and to do work on themselves and to be motivated and to be fulfilled so mm -hmm. type threes they um, think that the world needs to be in a sort of a natural order or flow and things need to happen so they set goals and develop plans and sort of execute on their plans, goals, plans, goals, plans, as efficiently and as effectively as possible. One of the threes that I know as who's a senior manager, he said, Ginger, I have so many goals and so many plans. I realized I even have plans that I don't even have goals for, or maybe I did once. <laughs> Is that funny? So I'm just going to let go of those plans. And then I'm going to look at these goals and say, are they, are they still things that are really important? Do I really want that? Or do I do it because I think I should, because it will make me appear successful and get respect. Enneagram mm -hmm. fours, well, they like to think of themselves as the unique people of the Enneagram. They're just sort of fundamentally, existentially, in their view, different. And the reason they are different is because they think they're different, but they 
like to be original. They like to be creative. They like to, you know, kind of be symbolic and metaphoric. And they like to engage in deep connections with others, although at one level they're um, always seeking that and then they get disappointed when that doesn't happen because, you know, we have lunch and we make a connection and we need to go back to our own spaces. And right. then endogram <laughs> five, those are the people or the type, the archetypes. Those are people that want to understand how the world works and they want to sort of see how everything fits together. So they're seeking knowledge and wisdom and they mm -hmm. try to find it intellectually. And, and when they do the work on themselves, they actually realize real knowledge, full wisdom comes from knowing the head, knowing from the heart, knowing from your gut. Type sixes are living in the world of uncertainty. They, there is uncertainty in this world, and they're trying to make some sort of certainty and meaning out of this kind of world that is somewhat chaotic. So they do anticipatory planning, and they are idealistic realists. They want the best to happen, and they know the worst could get in the way of that, so they identify obstacles. They tend to ask what-if questions, and you know they really hate when there's a simplistic answer to a complex problem. Really uh -huh. <laughs> right, crazy. Type sevens are the people that like to think anything's possible. No limits. Everything's possible. We can do anything with the right people, the right team, the right, don't put any limits on me. So they're looking right. for excitement and stimulation. But at the same time, they're avoiding limits, options being closed down, and feeling pain or discomfort. That's kind of their growth area or the growth edge. For each type, there's a growth edge. Then we have eights. They feel like they're, you know, the superheroes, Hercules. They've got to carry the world on their shoulders. They've got to save the city. They've got to be big because only the big survive or the strong and the weak need protection. So they become big. And they're hiding in that bigness, their deeper vulnerabilities and sort of, and they kind of deny with the, that they have a needs for support, contact. And that's sort of their development area. And then we have the nines that kind of see everything. They're the type that sort of sometimes thinks they're all types because they tend to blend and merge with particularly with people or that they think are kind of pleasant or, you know, for them. Um, and they're very good at mediating and they like harmonic environments where there's no tension, but they also avoid stating their opinions or they'll do so at the end. Or it's like the joke, it's not a joke, but it's like, do you say to a nine, where do you want to go for dinner? And they say, where do you want to go for dinner? It's like, well, where do you want to go for dinner? It's like, then I said, well, where do you want to say, Well, I'd like to go for, and you name it, you know, Italian, Chinese. Oh, I don't really want to go there. And you go, well, where would you like to go? Because they want to go so there's no right. tension, so to speak. So those are the nine types. Yeah, beautiful. I, I love how you described all the types. Uh, very inclusive of, of, I think, the positive strengths of each style. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I experienced when I first encountered the system was a very mm -hmm. easy to highlight kind of the the good sides of things, like I myself am a nine, and initially I thought, ooh, I, I'm a seven, I'm very optimistic, or a two, pretty helpful. And then when I saw the full scope of, of what a nine was, it kind of hit me a, l a little bit too hard. You know, I was like, oof. Uh, some, yeah, that's where it comes you know, from a yeah, pain, right? right? Yeah. Yes, right. Um, so can you g maybe give people a little pointer there as they've listened to you talk through these styles? How do they know uh, which one might be home for them? Well, they have to do more pursuit and but I can get it. Okay. For so sure. and I'll sort of just leap off what you said. So you thought you were a seven, but then it turned out you were a nine. Because mm -hmm. as you get right. So there's nine types and they also fit into various sets of three. And three mm -hmm. of the nine types are what we call the optimistic types. Seven, nine, and two. That's yep. me. Okay, so you thought you knew you were an optimistic kind of person. That means you kind of mm -hmm. optimism defined by world looks a little better than it is. You kind of like it that way. But I always yeah. make a joke, but which people can relate to, I think, that the sevens take a whole happy pill every morning because they need to see everything better than it is. And the nines uh -huh. take half a pill because they need to see teams and groups and environments as better than they are. And then the twos take a quarter of a pill because we only need to see people as better than they actually are. Until they're not. Now, so that might be helpful if you are think of yourself as an optimist. Now, there's three types that we call the intent, the comp competency types. One, mm -hmm. type one, type three, and type five. And what that means is that they deeply want to feel competent and want people to treat them like they're competent. But they have mm -hmm. different definitions. And they get very kind of reactive when they don't feel that way. So ones define competency as having the right answers. Mm. 
and knowing they're having the right path of action. Well, that's not threes because threes like to have answers and they don't like to look embarrassed like they don't know something, but they're not so concerned about being right and they don't necessarily think of their path as, of action as the right. Threes are about being respected. Competency mm-hmm. is the same as being respected for getting results and knowing how to get there. Now, fives, competency means something different. It's knowing something. They're not concerned about whether you think it's right or not, because if they know it, they know it. And it's like, they don't get charged up about that. But, you know, it's for knowledge. So those are, are you a competency type? Mm -hmm. Or are you one of the three, call it intensity types. Sometimes people refer to it as reactive, but I like intensity better. I think we're all reactive. You know, that's what we're working on. Okay, so... I try to use language that describes if it doesn't judge, which, you know, you probably like because you're nine and you're into non Absolutely. Judging. Love it. <laughs> good. Okay. So, and I'm into two. I don't want people to feel bad by language I use. That was unnecessary. But so same result, different motivations. But let's four, sixes, and eights. So they're very intense. These are people that when you're with them, you feel, okay, they're tense. And if you're intense, you don't notice you like it. If you're not one of those three types, you go, that's a little intense, right? Fours are emotionally intense. They're running a lot of feelings internally. Sixes are running mental intensity. They're always going, what if, what about this? This could happen. A lot of, and eights are running or somatic or body-based. You can feel their energy and their bigness and their presence. No matter if they're short people or thin or have more weight on them or they're 80 or they're eight, you know, or they're quiet or they're talking, whatever, you can feel them in the room. Because of yeah. their somatic presence, and that's a somatic intensity. So that might be helpful for people. Awesome. Know. That's that's really wonderful. Thank you for giving us that tour and uh, helping people kind of get a sense of, of the map itself. Um, I'd okay. love to hear just a little bit of backstory with how you got engaged with it and came to um, turn this into something that is something you're doing professionally and working with organizations around. Well, my story is a little insane. All right, let's hear it. <laughs> Ready for it? Yeah, bring okay. it on. So I spent many years as a teacher, as an organization development consultant, as a trainer, as a coach, before mm-hmm. the Enneagram appeared. And I was getting a little bored. I was like, okay, I'm a little bored. But I'm not really bored. I'm, but there's something more I'm supposed to do. So mm-hmm. I went to a retreat center in, based in California that had programs scheduled. And the only program, because I have a lot of years of self-development in me and I'm a trained gestalt therapist, the only program I didn't know anything about was something called the Enneagram. So mm-hmm. I sign up for that. Just I go there. It's billed as a beginning course, and it's actually advanced. So I'm one of 40 people. Everybody else knows everything but me. Five days. Uh-huh. So I sit there, and I go, okay, numbers, were, that, that didn't feel right to me because I don't like – personality systems actually i think they make people put people in boxes mm-hmm. and they're reductive and i'm like okay but then i stay and then after five days i was like you know this is a very powerful system so i only plan to use it for myself this is what's insane about this but that's not insane that i went there so i'm leaving this growth center it's at the top of the mountains in the pacific ocean and i am a very sane grounded person and all of a sudden I go outside and I see a blimp or dirigible in front of me, but I'm like, I'm blinking. Is that in the sky? Is it, you know, I don't know. I saw this Uh image and it had a little tail on it. It said, your job is to bring the Enneagram out more into the world. I'm like, an actual sign. (laughs) Yeah, a sign. I mean, to this day, I know I saw it, but it was in my mind, right? Or where did that, okay. Uh I go, no, that's not my plan. And this came back a second time, said, it doesn't matter what your plan is. I'm going, okay, good, but what am I supposed to do? And then it came back, just be still, it'll be clear. Mm. So I was only planning to use the Enneagram for myself and my own development. I said, I don't have to do anything. So I took myself off to a rather intensive Enneagram training program to learn all about it. And part of the Mm -hmm. program was we had to type 20 people, do a typing individuals. And I, I didn't have enough. I just moved to Los Angeles and I didn't have enough friends there. 
And I had relatives, but I really didn't feel like that's not a good idea necessarily to type your relatives. Right. You don't want to start there. (laughs) I don't want to start there. So I had a lot of clients. So I would go out and I'd ask my clients and I'd do a typing process and I'd give them a book because, you know, I felt like I should give them something. They got really intrigued by it and said, can you help me with my leadership with this? Can you help me with my team? And there I was. That was my beginning journey. And then the, the second part that's kind of insane, I did... Uh, there was a lot of teaching of the Enneagram, but a lot of it was just through lecture. And I'm about mm-hmm. interaction, right? I go, you have a real life system with real life people. Let's we be alive. So I did a presentation on interactional Enneagram work, how to do that at an international Enneagram Association conference. And I had just come from a client with very rudimentary training tools. So I had a whole lot of people there and they go, what tra- What do you use for materials? And I had, I showed them. And then they swarmed me at the end of the session and they said, can we buy them? Well, they weren't for sale and I only had what I had. Uh And I don't know if you, well, you probably didn't. But when I was younger, I took belly dancing just because I thought it would be good exercise, you know, and they put money in your, you know, in the belly dancing, you know about that, Uh you know, when they like your dancing. So I'm up there with these tools and they're stuffing, people are stuffing money in my pockets and taking the tools, and I was like, I felt like, oh, my gosh, I guess I'm supposed to provide training tools for people. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so that's all. And then it ended up with nine books and lots of tr- certification programs, and that's insane, isn't it? I never planned I, Oh, this. Absolutely. I love that. I love that you went from, okay, I'm just learning about this thing. I, first of all, that your first introduction was five days. You were willing to just like, oh, I don't know what this is, but let's see all the way through what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that almost you couldn't avoid – uh, turning it into a, a product and a business, and then and the, and then you're just kind of yada yada. It's like, well, nine books later, you know, <laughs> it's like that's a lot of work, Ginger. I, I mean, that that's a that's a huge body of work. That's amazing. Well, it is a body of work, but you know, I don't love writing. Although my mm-hmm. books, I like my books. You've read them, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. But I write I write to help people do use the Enneagram better in some way. I don't. It's not the. I don't identify so much like. Author of nine books, yeah, but it's there for a purpose. So I, I try to do them absolutely as best as I can, and mm-hmm. I don't take three years per book because I, I really rather be facilitating groups with it and teaching than yeah. writing. So you know, my reward for doing the book is to get out there with people. Fantastic! I love it. Well, I think uh, mm-hmm. everyone that you've come into contact with is glad that you have followed this path. <laughs> Myself I don't know. included. I'll see. Yeah. Right. Um, well, so we've used the, the Enneagram here at Gooder since about 2018. Um, I'd love to just discuss the role that you've seen the Enneagram play in shaping company culture, um, how it can contribute to a more productive, healthier culture, better relationships, better conversations, all that kind of thing. Well, here, I am probably more curious about how you're using it effectively at Gooder than I am in sharing, but I'll share a little bit. Will you share also a little bit about how you're yeah, using yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. I really want to know. Okay, so I think the Enneagram is the most amazing system to do all kinds of things in organizations. Mm-hmm. And it can change fundamentally the culture and the way of doing the work. And you can use the Enneagram in so many different ways. So, so for example, if you want to use it in a leadership development program, whatever that is constructed. And, you know, and I've done leadership development for years. Leaders are in the most challenging position because they have all this responsibility. And now there's so much change and uncertainty. And who do they talk to about what to do and what they're thinking? They, they might go to a coach, but then, some, right. you know, you don't want the coach to somehow be leading the organization. Who do they really talk to? And it's like, who are their peers? And even in, organizations if it's not the leader it's like the, even different levels a lot of people don't feel historically comfortable with sharing where they feel uncertain or anything the enneagram changes all that because it makes yeah. it really okay to be really good at something but it'll, your type will also show you as based on your leadership your t- enneagram type because your leadership style grows out of that actually it'll show you yeah. where you need to work you can work on your development before it becomes a problem for you it can be fun. Uh-huh. There's multiple paths. I mean, it's just brilliant that way. And it creates, um, I've seen doing it this way, creates a collective of, I'm into collectivity and uh-huh. you know, collaboration. It, it gives yeah. people from being individualistic and competitive 
to being collaborative and supportive where development mm-hmm. is working on it is a it's kind of a badge of honor instead of something that's a you have to be embarrassed about um yeah yeah you teams it's amazing um now one of the things also that i love and then i'm going to ask you but one of the <laughs> biggest cultural things is about empowerment and, and self-responsibility like when mm-hmm. people learn their enneagram type and they really not just to describe themselves, but also see, here's the strengths, here's the development, here's what I can do. Um, I'm interacting with other people. It's not them. That's the problem. It might be partly, but it's also me. You know, there's things I can work on. So I start to take agency or this is what I can do about myself to make myself easier to work with. And if I want to approach you as a nine, and I know that there's a couple of different ways that I could approach you, I want to say something Mm -hmm. to you. I could choose one that all of which are honest and truthful that might be easier for you to hear than another way that you might be challenging for you to hear. And so it changes the um, agency so that you, people start taking responsibility for themselves. Plus it's a yeah. lot of fun. Anyway, right. <laughs> exactly. And I can go Wonderful. on and on, but tell me, how are you using it there? Sure. Well, we'll, we'll start on the fun point. Um, we use it. It's, it's a really cool, I mean, it's a deeply personal experience, right? Especially if you join a company, you've just started a new job. You also discover your Enneagram type, lots of personal change going on. Um, and at that moment, um, to be able to meet that change with a greater understanding of yourself and, and, uh, like you said, your strengths and challenges, your communication style. Uh, we, I believe this is from the recovery world, but I always bring up that expectations are resentments waiting to happen, right? We mm-hmm. can see what we expect of the world, of each other, um, exactly. and recognize and take ownership of that rather than blaming others for not meeting those unspoken needs, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that provides an instant connection point. For everyone mm-hmm. who's just joined, we, we hire folks in uh, onboarding teams. So we just hired Team Unicorn. Um, before that was Team Kraken, right? So everyone comes in with a, a glasses name. <laughs> um, and so they're, they get a chance to bond with each other in that way. And that's a common point of, of just conversation, interesting point, right. way to learn about each other. Um, right. And so that's a really uh, kind of easy opening uh, place to start there. Um, and mm-hmm. then that also allows people to understand their peers that they've just uh, become a part of a new team, right? Their manager. Um, it provides some common language, some shared language to discuss those kind of what otherwise might be hidden expectations or hidden um, right. patterns. This kind of puts them out into the open. So it makes it yeah. a little easier to work with the control yeah. board, so to speak. No, and I think, you know, using it that way, which is fantastic is it reduces a lot of conflict mm-hmm. as people, you know, a lot of conflicts because pe- I expect you to do things the way I do and you're not meeting my expectations and that, you know, with this way and I, it's uh, my expectations are mine. They probably go a lot with my type. Mm-hmm. Um, by working on myself and my type, my expectations will relax. And I also am not going to expect you because you're not the same to have the same ones I have. So we can have a conversation about that. Um, right. Yeah. And, you know, so that's great. Well, I'm so happy to hear how you're using it. Oh, yeah. And there are other ways, too. Um, but honestly, I think we're looking for, we're always uh, on the lookout for more ways to, to apply the power of the Enneagram mm-hmm. uh, because it, it is a integrated part of everything we do. I think we'll, we start to forget about it, you know, and just it becomes just another piece of data that right. we're aware of. Um, but have you seen anything where you've, uh, been able to really integrate some p- positive change with a group by approaching some exercise or some piece of, of knowledge or practice that might help shift things in a positive way? Well, I'm the person that loves to think about all the different ways the Enneagram can be used and applied, particularly in organizations. So I'll just drop this yeah. one for you. Okay. Great. <laughs> have you, because have you, you're, you're team-based, yes. right? And everybody on the team knows their type, mm-hmm. correct? All right. Yep. So team effectiveness is everything. Yeah. So have you used the Enneagram as a map of the team? Is that mm. an idea? Uh, yeah. So like everyone knows each other's styles, but you mean to like create a map of the team and what would you include on that map? How might that look? Okay. So 
Okay, so I'm actually speaking to you, but this may actually re- resonate with some people listening. So sure. the, the, I said there's several triangles, and I know you know this triangle, but there's three Enneagram types that are formed in the body center, eights, nines, and ones. And that means they mm-hmm. are about uh, wanting things to be under control, although in three different ways, and sort of justice, right, and taking action or inaction. Sure. Then there's three types that are formed in the heart center, twos, threes, and fours, and they're about relationships, morale, it, how we're perceived by others in the organization. And then there's the head types, five, six, and seven. They're about thinking, researching, planning, you know, contingencies, etc. Mm-hmm. So if you take the people on the team and you put, see, if you imagine the map, it's because it starts at nine. At the, I know you know this, but I'm trying to, yep. at nine at the top and it goes around and then it goes up to eight. So it's like they're all around. You can put dots on the numbers that are representative of people on the team. Mm -hmm. And then you do an analysis. I can take a team, if I see that, and I can go in with close to 98% accuracy, I can tell you how that team functions in terms of over, under, or balanced representation of the eights, nines, and ones, the action center, or Mm -hmm. the head center, or the heart center. More too many in this center is going to create an imbalance. No, none in this is not. So, for example, a client... And then you can take it to micro levels from that, but sure. it's awesome. So I had a client that was had a lot of the head center. This was an IT group. And mm-hmm. they had quite a few in the body center, eight times at once. And almost, they only had one person in the heart center. So I was doing this map, center-based map with them. And they did really well. We're really good at getting things done. We can execute, we get ideas. And yes, there could be tension between the ideas and the execution, but we've worked that out. We're pretty, you know, they say that. So I go, well, what about the heart center? Like a little bit, uh-huh. not so many there. And they go, what's the problem? And I go, well, you don't, you only have one. And they go, that's not a problem. I go, well, the map <laughs> suggests it is, and th- yeah. th- you know, so I'm a, I don't really push in people's face, but I try three times. I said, well, you really want to consider it could be a problem. Okay. So they go, no, we're good. So then the, they, I go, fine. So I leave. And then the next day, their admin person calls me. She says, they told me what happened. You're so right. This team had the lowest morale stores in our whole company. Mm. And I told them, you, they need to listen to you. That's funny. Yeah. I listening. So then the next time I met with them, they actually said, you know, you were right. We just didn't see what we didn't want to see. So they said, and yeah. so I go, it's so good. What are you going to do about it? Because it's a really terrible idea to hire people by type or center because if they don't have the skills, and as you would know, a high level of self-mastery, because then they're mm-hmm. more flexible, easier for everybody. So skills and self-mastery, right, and experience. So, no, no, no. Some people want to just go, let's just hire. A, no, don't hire from type or center. So I said, what are you going to do? And they said, well, we're going to do two things. First of all, we're going to have a retreat. I want, they wanted me to lead it, where we get to know each Maybe. other better. We really don't. You know, we're just <laughs> doing the work, thinking thoughts and doing the work. And the other is that every, we have in our room, they had a particular room they always met in, but they put up a big sign. They said, see that sign? It said, think about, before you make any decision, consider the impact on people. Uh-huh. And that's what Helping they did. Call their mind toward the thing that's missing on the map. Missing. And they actually really did that, and it made a huge difference. Yeah. And they could see their morale scores go up. It was amazing, you know. But so that's just one example. But it's like amazing this map. So starting with the center. So how else might you be applying insights from the Enneagram to understand team dynamics, um, company culture? Just look using it as a lens to to see that a little more clearly. Leadership. Teams, um, culture. Mm-hmm. So we talk about culture, organizational culture. It, my experience with using the Enneagram in larger work, and I, when I say larger work, I don't mean that everybody in the organization has to go through 100 hours of training or something. Totally mm-hmm. not. Mm-hmm. One of the organizations that I worked with a lot in one very 500 person business unit of them. Um, I worked with all the leaders. There were 150. Worked with the senior leadership team. They said, 
Oh, bring it to the managers. The managers liked it. Okay. Uh-huh. So bring it to the employees, but they couldn't make it mandatory, but they ended up saying it was so much, in, so engaging, so much fun that they got uh-huh. better compliance on the underground programs than they did on the ones that were federally mandated. But that's, <laughs> you know, so I, and all of the people on these teams, they had one day of work on the underground, mm-hmm. finding their type. And then we applied it to uh, communication style and to feedback, giving each other feedback. Cause that's another thing is there is a kind of a presumption in organizations that it's the leader or the manager who's the only one who could or should give feedback. And you know what? It's because other people either don't know how or they don't want to, or they feel scared about it. So, yeah, we, you know, training yeah. everybody to give feedback, that's everybody's responsibility so that the manager Absolutely. doesn't have to bear the burden of it. So that's a culture change and that's feedback culture. But then we ended sure. with conflict. Mm. Go ahead. I was going to say we're big on feedback here. That's something we've uh, developed or um, expanded on a number of systems to help work with that. Just uh, briefly, in your approach to teaching folks feedback through the lens of the Enneagram, can you can you give just some pointers or high level tips there to? um, Oh yeah, I can. I mean, I can. You know, I can run through all nine types, but um, okay. (laughs) So let's just assume. I'm going to assume we, that we want people to give feedback and to be able to use the Enneagram to do so, right? Yes. So part, the first one, a part of it is if you, everybody knows their type and they know what the work is, right? And I, in, in the other story, I was going to say that even though we told people after one day, you don't know the system well enough, don't go around typing everybody, have humility, we can't tell you. And I know you're going to do so, so tell them you're not supposed to. <laughs> okay. Right. So what happened is new people kept coming to our program and people said, they, I, they think I'm of this type, but they said that was maybe not true and I weren't supposed uh-huh. to say. And 95% of the time, they, they were accurate because uh-huh. teams that use it every day and they're really working with each other and they and if people have their types right initially and it spreads, they learn more about the system than a lot of endogram teachers do in real time, real life. Sure. Oh, yeah, so, absolutely. So, so to feedback. So one of the most important aspects, but not the only is how receptive are we to feedback and how does our type influence that? Mm -hmm. And interestingly, some of the underground types are pretty closed off to feedback. It doesn't matter because they, and certain ones are overly responsive to feedback. Oh, you think this? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That must be true. Because I always say, Uh you have to think about, is it, is it true? And is it useful? Because it could be true, but Mm -hmm. not useful. (laughs) Right. Or right. it could be useful, but not particularly true. Correct. I mean, it's interesting. So, but, yeah. you know, so twos and nines tend to be over responsive to feedback, sometimes sixes, mm-hmm. right? And fives tend to be under responsive because, and eights, because fives tend to think, um, I'm kind of a world of my own and I don't need mm-hmm. to hear how other people are responding. And eights will t- hear feedback, but they tend to like it only from people they respect. They'll uh-huh. take feedback. But they don't respect very many people. So they're in also in a little bit of a scarcity Tricky. model. And the others are yeah. So that's one way is to understand that about yourself and your type. Um, then there is the how comfortable are we giving feedback to other people and how does our type influence that? Okay, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, mean, I would have to say probably nobody, if they had five things they could do electively, would choose giving feedback to somebody else as their number one or two or three thing. But we can all learn right, to be that better. That would be high on the list. <laughs> you know? And also people tend to think of feedback as I'm going to say something negative. Mm-hmm. And it's not, it isn't? No. The feedback idea is it works for positive and it works for negative. Okay. So it's funny. So, so I teach people the feed, we call it feedback formula and must be similar to what you use. But it's about observable behavior. Mm-hmm. What do you observe in the person you want to give feedback to? Positive or negative? What is the impact of that behavior on you, on them, on the team? And what would you like to see different or the same? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's like three parts. So yeah. okay. So we people we have people practice it. And then you can if you know your own type, you can see what we teach, what strengths do you have in those giving the feedback and where do you need to be careful? You know, mm-hmm. like ones may have realized that they may come across as a critical voice or they may not everybody wants to be as perfect as they want to be 
right? Or, you know, choose me, you have to realize that everybody wants your help. You know, uh-huh. it's like, you know, and the three have to realize sometimes you have to take longer to give feedback. It's a process, you know, it's like, so, so on. But For sure. Also and that's, okay. uh, depersonalizes it, right? When I understand oh. that that's my personality in motion, it's not a personal problem for me or, or that someone else has. Right. It's just a, another layer of data to work with. It's a layer of data to work with. And we practice on the positive because people think, oh, I, can, I don't have to get positive. Okay. Now, the other thing that's interesting with this is some people, some types do not like positive feedback. It's harder for them to <laughs> receive than the negative. And that yeah. is a stunning thing. But it's, it's type-based. So Enneagram 7s, who everybody thinks every all they want to hear is positive and they just want positive. No, actually, they don't hear positive feedback. They just it rolls off them. Huh. What happens is that if they hear negative feedback, they want to know what it is so they can fix it quickly so they can feel good again. Uh-huh. It's it's, it's really it's intriguing. And then so there's the, aspects the like good that. Good doubles down on the good so it doesn't re- really go anywhere, but the negative course, is like, like not okay. No. So. Some types don't like public positive feedback. Mm-hmm. So if we assume, because our t- people, I would, not I wouldn't, but actually, but some people, it has a little to do with extroversion, introversion too, but not sure. everybody likes positive public feedback. And so you're giving it and you don't understand why this person is upset. It's like mm. the, sh- the show was, the light was on them too long. They didn't know what to say to this, you know, so to understand it, but also how to customize the three-part feedback formula to each type and we teach that so if you know mm-hmm. the type of the so it's like fantastic yeah amazing and then the last thing you were kind of aiming toward was conflict yeah yeah <laughs> important <laughs> i mean that's kind of the business of uh dealing with each other right is yeah. get, getting through or avoiding or otherwise resolving conflict do you want me to say something about that yeah any um any high level observations uh, about how that has been effective in organizations? Because I think there's a very, uh, there's a resistance to the idea of vulnerability. And then there's also emotional professionalism, right? And I think the Enneagram provides a nice bridge. Um, and if you have mm-hmm. some insight there, I, I would love for you to share it. Okay. Yeah. So this is, uh, it, this is my counterintuitive, but based on experience, approach that I think works really well. I mm-hmm. like to end my programs if I can with conflict application. And mm-hmm. the reason that's counterintuitive is like people think, oh that's hard, that's painful, that's difficult, that's this, that's that. Okay. Sure. But my experience, the way I do it, it's kind of got a philosophy to it. It's like, okay, so we have things that are based on our Enneagram type that tend to trigger us. Mm-hmm. You were referenced expectations, right? Um, yes. And also in t- ways we interpret things that happen that may or not be what actually happened, but we believe it's true. So Absolutely. we have these hot buttons or triggers that are type based. So I teach that and we identify what are the type based triggers that you have mm-hmm. based on your type. You already know your type. And then I put people, if I have a group size big enough, which I like, is um, put people in. P- groups with people of their same type and they talk about their triggers and give examples. Uh Now they love that. Somebody (laughs) finally understands me. Yeah. Another connection (laughs) point bonding. It's a bonding thing. And it's like, yes. And then they can see, yes, this is about my type, but I'm also not alone in this. And Mm -hmm. they, they they start laughing. It's kind of cathartic. It feels like yeah, fun. what a relief! It's not just me. <laughs> it's not just me, and this is and yeah, you yeah, and that would yeah, that and that. So that kind of is fun. But then they also talk about so given that this is our trigger, my trigger, and it's going to trigger me in the future. What is the work that I need to do or I can do because this is going to trigger me again in the future if I don't? What's the work mm-hmm. for development based on my type that I can do? Yeah. You get to come up with that. So there's always a, de- I think it's important to always have a developmental piece that it isn't like something's wrong with you. So you have to fix it, but here's a thing you can do if you want to. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, you know, Amazing. So, and lately I've been experimenting with new ways to do it too. So my new thing is 
I have, um, I did this with a senior executive team of a very large multinational company. They looked at me and said, she's asking us, yes, you're going to do this, right? Okay. Uh-huh. So <laughs> they have these pinch conversations, what triggers them or, you know, and they, and type and all that. And then I brought a bunch of arts and crafts materials. I mean, feathers and balloons and, you know, you name it, cards. And I had everything. Um, and they had to create it within their type, a train. Pin, uh, they call it pinch, you know, instead of a trigger, a pinch, but pinch is yep, a sure. pinch transformer that the next time they get pinched, they can use it to <laughs> transform their pinch into something that's an insight and development. And they kind of looked at me and, I, and they had a great time. Yeah. Doing, and then they shared their transformer there and they did it as a type group. So it wasn't like an individual, but it was right, pretty right. powerful. So that cool. you, know, you can make it fun. Yeah, totally. We love arts and crafts around here. So uh, maybe we'll look into that. (laughs) Cool. Well, uh, Ginger, it has been so wonderful to speak with you about all this. You have so many insights to share. Um, For folks who would love to learn more, uh, can you share a couple of books or resources that they can look into to follow up? I think it depends. Feel free to plug your own. (laughs) I know, but, you know, so I think it's important uh, to, you know, you start out gradually and you get deeper and deeper, right? Mm-hmm. How did you learn about it? I'm curious, Sean. Myself, personally, um, I was visiting a company in Australia and they had numbers on all their cubicles and I was like, what the heck is this? And they turned out they had like a full-time mm-hmm. Enneagram coach on staff. Uh, so they typed us, everyone who was visiting in our group. And oh, from there, cool. it was what like a wonderful friends, thing. family. You can see yeah. how international <laughs> this is. Huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah so if you're interested... Um, I guess what I say, and I don't know that I'm, I, I would probably send you to my website, the Enneagram in business.com because mm-hmm. I put that website together, not as a promotional, like hire me, the kind of thing, but it's actually a resource page. And there's a section yeah. on, um, you know, the Enneagram and it's like, it has a description of the types and then <clears throat> differentiators between types and, then it's got a thing on Instagram applications and it's got graphics showing, you know, core things that people around communication, what each type would say or sales or leadership. And you could, that's a drop down. And then plus, you know, strengths, development areas, et cetera. So I think you know, it's free. Uh, you can start there, kind of explore it. Um, yeah. You know, and I would start there and see, you know, and if you're kind of, int- you'll know whether the Instagram grabs you or not. I think, you know, some mm-hmm. people, it grabs right away and they just go like this and other people go, I want to read some more books about it. I've written several books on it. Um, my first one, Bring Out the Best in Yourself at Work, is around the core applications in business. It does have a typing mm-hmm. chapter. I have a leadership book. What type of leader are you? I have a coaching yeah, both are book. Great. And then one of my bestsellers is The Art of Typing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, do you have that book, Sean? I do, yes. It's helped uh, type a number of folks here at Gooder. <laughs> Yeah, because it's like there are Enneagram tests out there, but they're only there's more tests now than I have fingers and toes for. Right. Yeah, they're everywhere. And they're only about 65, if at best, percent accurate. So you can get false positives or negatives. So I wrote that book because I do a lot of typing, helping people find their type in groups. So that's a good one if you really want to get the architectures of the nine types. It's not the beginner beginner, but it could be a secondary one. Um, sure. So I think there's different ones. Let's see what I like. There's specialty books I like. Like I'm trying Got to it. think. Maybe just share a couple. Well, there's a book out by one of my mentees and a, another colleague called Reclaiming You, and it's on Enneagram and tra- Trauma. Mm-hmm called Reclaiming You, and it's really powerful. So if for some reason that's something you want to know more about, that's helpful. Um, now, several people who, I mean, if you're into the Instagram and you want to get sort of to the spiritual, not it's not religious, but spiritual mm-hmm. aspects of the Instagram, I've always been a big fan of Sandra Maitre's book, The Spiritual Dimensions of the Instagram. It's a mm-hmm. really good book. She writes in a spiral. So if you need a linear writing, it's not for you. But if you don't mind spiral writing uh, or you can learn that way, it's good. 
Yeah, not really familiar like with that, that, but I'm willing to give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, um, and the, it's one of the interesting books where the append, the back of the book after the chapters is as good as the book itself. It's like sometimes I go more to rare. the back. <laughs> yeah, but you yeah. can start at the back and then, you know, it is rare. Yeah. Um, let's sure. see. Uh, my son and I wrote a book called The Art of the Enneagram, which is metaphoric, all these pictures, and it takes you through the journey and stuff. You might like that. Um what else do cool. I like? I don't know. That'll give me a start. Yeah, I think that's a pretty solid list, Ginger. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. And just before we jump, any any uh, like words of advice or just something, maybe your favorite thing about the Enneagram that you want to leave our listeners with? Yeah, what's coming to me, John, the Enneagram can do different things for different people at different times in their life. Mm. So as one of my key clients said, that's the system he's ever ex- been exposed to where people bring it home to their families and it makes a difference beyond work. Right. And one of the questions that I would get asked, I get asked a lot when I'm working, not so much online because I think people are a little shyer, but when I'm in person, they would say, what kind of person? They wanted me to talk about romantic relationships and what they were, you know, who should I marry or partner with uh-huh. or something? And, you know, the Enneagram doesn't, Types. It's not about this type with that type, but the Instagram can show you where you're going to get along well and what areas are going to be conflictual based on your two mm-hmm. types. But it, it's not like this type goes better with that because the best predictor of a really productive, healthy relationship is your level of self-mastery and your partners and that you're working on your growth, moving at the same time because one person advances a lot and the other person's stuck. That's a bit problematic. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I can say that personally resonates with me in a big way. Before um, my wife and I encountered the Enneagram, we kind of, I, th- I would say we were blaming each other for the ways that we just naturally are. And as soon as yeah. we discovered it, it immediately depersonalized that conflict and we realized, oh, it this does. is what I'm working with. This is what you're working with. We can support each other in that work. What type is she? She's a three. Ah, so you're on the arrow line to each other. Yep. <laughs> that gives you something in common, but also... That's what typically happens in long-term relationships. People partner with people because of the arrows, usually mm-hmm. the arrows or the person on either side of their type, but rarely with the same type. That can be. Yeah. Wow. Ah, opposites. Well, you already somehow. know that <laughs> yeah, yourself. Why would you yeah. make a long-term commitment? You can be alone and do that. Right. Right. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, Ginger, it's been so wonderful to speak with you. Thank you for sharing your time and your insights with us. Really appreciate you joining us on the podcast today. Oh, I've been at a lot of fun. And yeah, thank you for likewise. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. All right, so uh, for folks listening, the Enneagram in business.com if you'd like to learn more. Um, and thanks for, for tuning in. Thanks for listening to the Culture Gooder podcast. To submit questions for the podcast, learn more about our culture, and learn how you can status the quote challenge, head over to gooder.com slash culture. And don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you're listening, including on YouTube, where you can now watch all of our new episodes. Who knows? You might even catch a glimpse of Carl at our headquarters if he's not already passed out at the tiki bar from all the margaritas.